Hi, Jerry Jenkins here talking about all things writing. Today, writing your novel's best ending. Of my more than 200 published books over the last half century, more than two-thirds have been novels, so I know story ideas are easy to come by. Maybe you have one you're excited about, but you're stuck. You've been sitting on your great idea for too long, so what's keeping you from writing your novel? If it's that you find daunting the idea of landing on and delivering just the right ending, you've come to the right place. Have you ever wondered why publishers rarely offer contracts and royalty advances to first-time novelists before they see the entire manuscript? You may have the best novel idea since Chicken Soup for the Left Behind Amish Vampire, but until you prove you can finish, and I mean close that curtain with a resounding thud, all you're getting from publishers is 50 shades of wheat and sea. You know your opening should hook readers, and your middle must keep them turning the pages. Your goal is to get them to an ending that seals the deal. But how do you write one that turns readers into rabid fans? Your ending must simply prove worthy of the time, money, and loyalty readers have invested in reading your novel. It has to be memorable and emotionally satisfying, tying up all loose ends. That's no small task. So how do you ensure your novel doesn't fizzle out at the end? Here are three things to keep in mind. First, keep the end in sight the whole way. Second, the end means the end. Nothing should come after it. Third, remember to keep your hero on stage all the way through. What do I mean by keeping the end in sight? In other words, don't simply assume something will come to you and will simply work itself out when the time comes. Whether you're a meticulous outliner or right by the seat of your pants, have an idea where your plot is going and think about your ending every writing day. How you expect the story to end should inform every scene, every chapter. Sure, it can be flexible. It may change, evolve, and grow as you and your characters experience their inevitable arcs, but never leave it to chance. And if you get near the end and worry something's missing, that the punch isn't there, or that it doesn't live up to the power of the other elements of your book, don't rush it. Give it a few days, a few weeks if necessary. Read through everything you've written. Take a long walk. Think on it. Sleep on it. Jot notes about it. Let your subconscious work on it. Play what-if games. You want that ending to sing, to become unforgettable. As I've said, your readers will have invested in you and your work the entire way. They deserve a proper payoff. Your ending must not be rushed or even appear rushed. If it's a surprise ending, think of movies like The Sting or The Sixth Sense. You still want readers to feel they should have seen it coming because you planted enough hints, but they will not want to feel hoodwinked. Write and rewrite and polish and hone it until you're happy with every word. Rewrite it until it shines. I've long been on record that all writing is rewriting, and this is never more true than at the end of your novel. When do you know it's been rewritten enough? When you've gone from making it better to merely making it different. What makes us authors is being able to decide which version is best and then committing to it. Now, here's a nice problem. Maybe you have too many ideas for how your novel should end. That's good news. It shows you're a creative. Better to have too many ideas than too few. Just be sure to settle on the best one. When in doubt, don't necessarily go for the cleverest or most cerebral. Readers long to be moved. Settle on an ending that reaches the heart. All right, moving on. When you reach the end, the end should mean the end. What do I mean? Too often, writers wind things up and feel the need to add an epilogue. My advice? Try not to do that. I'm not saying there's never a call for an epilogue. I've used them occasionally myself. But as a rule, let your the end mean the end. Also, too many beginners, I believe, think they appear sophisticated if they leave things nebulous. That might work in literary fiction where the writing itself is the star and the plot is more of a vehicle to show that off. I write for the masses and teach that you should write for the masses. So if that's what you want to do, avoid that mistake of feigning sophistication. Modern readers raised on television and movies appreciate chronologies, stories with beginnings, middles, and ends, and they expect the end to do its job. Archie types may think it's hip to just stop the story with nothing resolved, gassing on talk shows about how life isn't so tidy. Well, terrific. I've seen enough movies that end simply like that, and I can tell you that most people don't like sitting there shaking their heads as the lights come up. They scowl at each other and say, really? That's it? We're to wonder now what happens? All that does for me is to remind me that as a novelist, I have one job, and I recommit myself to doing it again every time. 
That is to invent a story world and deliver a satisfying experience for my readers. Now, writing a novel with a beginning, a middle, and an end, one that satisfies, doesn't necessarily mean happily ever after everything tied up in a neat bow. But at the very least, the reader should learn what happened, have questions answered, things resolved, puzzles solved. And because I happen to have a worldview of hope, my work will reflect that. If you write from another worldview, at least be consistent. End your stories with how you see life, but don't simply stop the story. Give it the ending it deserves. That said, some stories end too early and then appear contrived. If they end too late, you've asked your reader to indulge you for too long. Be judicious. In the same way you decide when to enter and leave a scene, carefully determine when to exit your novel. Also, don't forget your hero. He or she needs to be on stage to the last page. That may seem obvious, but I've seen it violated. Everything your lead character learned while trying to fix the terrible trouble you plunged them into should by now have made them the person who rises to the occasion and wins the day. Maybe to this point they've been flawed, weak, defeated, but their character arc is about to become complete. The action must happen on stage, not just be something remembered or simply narrated. Be careful not to inject a miraculous resolution or have something happen because they finally realized something. Sure, things may have finally come together in their mind, but they must act. That's what makes a reader respond emotionally, and it should move you when you write it. That way you'll know it will move your readers. See yourself piloting a commercial airliner. You've taken your readers on a long, eventful journey. Now it's time to bring them in for a satisfying landing. Okay, so what types of endings do you have to choose from? Let me suggest six that authors typically use. First, the closed or resolved ending. This ties up all the loose ends in your plot and subplots. Your main character and significant supporting characters have grown, but a resolved ending doesn't have to be a happy one. Examples include To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, where all the storylines come together in the end, giving each character closure, and The Hollow by Agatha Christie. After loads of misdirection throughout, the murderer is revealed. Second, the opened or unresolved ending. This is one of the types of endings I personally don't care for, for reasons I outlined earlier. Some authors merely use unresolved cliffhangers, which I find thoroughly frustrate most readers. If you need to leave questions in the readers' minds, particularly in the case of a book series, wherein you need to give them a reason to buy the next book, there are other ways to accomplish this. To make sure readers clamor for your next book, don't use unresolved cliffhangers. Give readers a wholly satisfying ending to your book and simply hint at what is coming. That way they're pleased and eager at the same time. In my own Left Behind series, the first volume covers a lot of ground. The rapture, people having disappeared, others left to figure out what happened and face the Great Tribulation. It ends with four significant characters banding together to form what they refer to as the Tribulation Force. That became the title of Book 2. Here's the last paragraph of Book 1. The task of the Tribulation Force was clear and their goal nothing less than to stand and fight the enemies of God during the most seven chaotic years the planet would ever see. Unquote. In The Bourne Ultimatum by Robert Ludlum, the final book in his popular series ends with a solid win for good over evil. Bourne survives, which satisfies the reader, but we're left not knowing anything about his future. Naturally, that leaves the door open for more. All right, option number three, the ambiguous ending. Here, the conclusion is cryptic at best, but always vague. It leaves readers with questions they can answer for themselves. Life of Pi by Jan Martel is a good example of this kind of ending. Readers are left to come up with their own explanation of the story, or not. There's also The Stand by Stephen King. The novel has two different endings, and King wrote three additional possibilities for the TV adaption. The original version nicely ties up the characters' stories. The complete and uncut edition includes a darker epilogue continuing the circle. Now, on to one of my favorite types of endings to read, the surprise or twist ending. This ending can work for all genres, but especially for mysteries. But take care not to give readers the ending they might expect. Just avoid, as I mentioned earlier, a complete surprise that seems to come out of nowhere. If you opt for a twist, you must plant enough clues so readers at least have to admit they could have seen it coming. Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie includes loads of surprises and a satisfying, although unexpected, resolution. 
as does Water for Elephants by Sarah Gruen. Ending option number five is the closed circle. This one ties your conclusion back to where you started, often revisiting the opening scene or even the first line, but naturally now with a whole novel worth of added context. Check out The House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende, where the last line is the same as the first. The Dark Tower series by Stephen King also circles back to the first sentence. The man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. All right, finally, option six is the expanded ending, which means including the epilogue I wish you'd avoid. With this approach, after evil is defeated and the main story winds down, readers get a glimpse into the character's future. An example of one that works can be found in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows by J.K. Rowling. The series wraps up by answering the unspoken question in everyone's mind, does Harry finally find peace in life? Another appears in Mockingjay, the final installment in Suzanne Collins' The Hunger Games series. Her epilogue fast-forwards several years to end on a hopeful note. And I suppose if you can write as well as J.K. Rowling and Suzanne Collins, you can feel free to try an epilogue. Though I've made my preferences clear, that's all they are personal opinions reflecting my own taste. End your book in any of the ways we've discussed. Experiment. Have fun. Write what you'd read. Remember to read dozens of books in your genre so you're familiar with its conventions and expectations. And consider the emotional impact you want to leave on your readers. In a sweet ending, characters get both what they want and what they need. A semi-sweet ending delivers only what your characters need. A bittersweet ending gives them only what they want. In a bitter ending, characters get neither. Stephen King says that in real life, endings aren't always neat, whether happy or sad. Just endeavor to write an ending that makes your readers beg for your next book. If you found this video helpful, like it, comment on it, share it, and subscribe to my channel. Also check out my free writing assessment tool. Find it at jerryjenkins.com quiz or by clicking the link in the description below. And if you're looking for help in other areas of your writing, check out my blog at jerryjenkins.com blog. Finally, download my free writing guide, How to Write a Novel. You can find it in the description below. All the best with your writing, and I'll see you next time.